This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee on Thursday, October 22nd at 7.49 p.m. And we'll start with um, a roll call attendance. Um, Mr. Deming. Deming present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer. Looks like she just oh, left the meeting. Yeah. yeah. Um, McDonald present. Stan Ms. Stamper? I hit the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. Excellent. So you're present. Yeah, um, I'm present. Uh, so this evening, um, we have uh, a high volume of public comment um, to go through. That's our first order of business. Um, I will start with the um, voice recordings, the voice messages. Um, thank you everyone um, for submitting the comment. I, I noticed I posted it, the, the document is posted already on our um, school committee, the regional school committee agendas page. Um, so folks that uh, want to follow along at home may do it that way. Um, if you have trouble reading the document while it's um, projecting on screen, um, our uh, friends at Amherst Media have uh, signaled that the recording is HD recording so that the document is much more easily legible on screen. Um, but as I said, I will start with the with the voice recordings. Um, and I was alerted by this first caller that she neglected to um, give us her name. And I apologize if I mispronounce it, but her name is um, Elsa Pettit and she's calling from Amherst. Sorry, I'm going to start over. I have to turn my volume up. Hi, I'm writing again. Um, I'm talking again in support of revising your metrics uh, on your and your model to reopen schools in light of the new scientific findings. We found that many families have left the district, and we are worried that this will impact further families leaving the district again because um, they are not happy and they are trying to find private school if they can afford it. So this will increase the gap between families that can afford things and families that cannot. And overall, the long-term uh, worry that we have is that it's going to hurt the district and the school, the public school in the district. Uh, so we would like the to have a discussion uh, open to the parents uh, so that we can all voice our concern and maybe find a good consensus for all of us so that it's safe and people are happy to be able to return to school but in safe condition, of course. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gina. Kaufman. I have a child in the Building Blocks program, special education at Fort River. I would like to make a comment. Since returning to school in person, my special education daughter, instead of being depressed and regressing on every front, has been joyful and cooperative and advancing forward, eager to return to school every day. I am reaching out to implore you to use scientific metrics to decide when to close and reopen our schools rather than a fear-based metric created behind closed doors. Please reconsider the shutting down of our schools for our vulnerable special education students. Thank you. My number is Hi, my name is Rosemary Melfi. I live in Amherst. 
Uh, first, I want to thank everyone on the school committee for your time and effort and all that you continue to invest in managing and planning for this most unusual school year. We are the working parents, my husband and I, of a first grader with an IEP. We are reaching out today to convey our disappointment and concern about the decision to revert to remote learning for two weeks. It is our understanding that the criterion governing this decision is very conservative, setting the threshold for case counts per 100,000 people well below what is recommended by DESI and the leading health experts. Further, it was indicated in Dr. Morris's email that locally our positivity rate is below the agreed upon threshold and that the decision to close is being based on an increase in case counts in the wider county. Frankly, this seems extreme in the absence of more information about whether these cases are contained clusters or if there is evidence of wider community spread. I deeply appreciate that everyone wants to be safe. I want that too. But we must weigh the decision to close against the real and measurable costs of doing so. All students benefit from in-person learning. This is especially true of our youngest learners for whom remote learning is decidedly not optimal and for whom so much screen time is not developmentally appropriate. At this point, I want to emphasize that I am truly amazed at how well our teachers have adapted to the unusual circumstances we are in, and I feel the that the remote instruction we receive is as high quality as it can be given the constraints of this medium. No matter its quality, though, it cannot replace the benefits of in-person learning for students and their families. Students with disabilities are at high risk for falling behind. Some therapies do not translate well to the remote environment and rely heavily on parent involvement, which is a burden for working parents. To this point, during remote learning, we opted for fewer therapy sessions simply because we could not fit it into our household schedule. This is not what was best for our child, but it is what was required if we wanted to keep our jobs. We will also admit to not doing many of the asynchronous activities that are suggested, again, because this requires our direct involvement in facilitation, which is not always possible as we work and, and care for a toddler in the home. Recess is supposed to be a time when our child gets exercise and movement but it is also our toddler's nap time. <laughs> so he is not getting the outdoor time that seems to be an assumption built into the remote learning schedule. And these are just some examples of um, how you know, remote learning has affected us. Finally, it is my understanding that nearly 100 children have left the district, presumably to be homeschooled or attend private schools that are staying open for in-person learning. This is alarming and a very measurable cost of keeping our school buildings closed. This will affect resources allocated to our school district, which in turn will affect our entire school community. I want our district to prioritize safety, but I also want our district to adopt closure policies that place our district level risk tolerance in line with what is recommended by public health experts. Again, I so appreciate your leadership as we continue to navigate these murky waters. I recognize Hi, my name is Maureen Reed McNally. I live in Amherst and my public comment is on uh, the threshold of new COVID cases that is required to um, move from in-person schooling to remote, and I would strongly urge you to reconsider how low the threshold is for Amherst. Um, it, it seems like it's significantly lower than the rest of the state. That's what the recommendation is. And I have a kindergartner and a first grader, and they desperately need to be in the classroom if it is possible. So I would strongly urge you to consider um, raising that threshold. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicola Usher. I am a resident of Amherst. I am a parent to a Wildwood third grader, and I'm calling in regards to the recent return to remote learning for those students that were in phase one. I, I just want to say that I really hope that the school committee can um, renegotiate and be more flexible with the metrics that were initially laid out by the APEA. I completely um, defer to our educators in terms of their comfort level being in the building, but it seems a bit extreme at this point to have metrics that are lower than what we're seeing throughout the state and the CDC um, recommendations. I'm from New York City and it's just kind of astounding to me that I have friends in element with kids in elementary school in New York City that are able to go to school in person and we're not here when our, our caseload is, is relatively low. Um, the 28 just seems like an, un, an unreasonably 
high expectation and at this point it's just untenable to not have the kids in school and to have so much uncertainty it would have been better to have just said we were going to be remote for the full semester but now this um, constant back and forth and changing the date of when our children might go to school is just creating increased anxiety for parents and children and it's really unfortunate and I really hope that we can come up with more flexible metrics um, that are reviewed regularly and maybe allow us to not have a hard number but allow us to look at the average over a certain number of days after the number of cases go up but either way I just want to say that this is just this isn't a way that we can continue to live. Um, I really hope we can either do something to make sure that kids can stay in school for more than a week or just commit to being remote because this inconsistency is really hard on families. Thank you. My name is Bennett Hazlett. Uh, I'm the parent of a fourth ever third grader and a middle school seventh grader. I'm calling today to plead for the union and the school committee to find a way to do what I believe is the right thing, keep phase one kids in schools on Monday, which means you're visiting the agreement that specifies the thresholds for shutting the schools down. We have the most rigorous requirements in place in the state today, and we need more room for flexibility and discernment in order to, to, to contribute to stability in a difficult time. Somebody who wears a mask religiously outside of the home and who has had both parents contract and recover from COVID-19. I do not think this is either foolhardy or unsafe. What's unsafe is committing to a rigid and flexible set of triggers that pulls kids out of school almost as quickly as it puts them in. Thank you. My name is Dick Spire, and I am an Amherst resident and Fort River parent of a kindergartner and second grader. I'm calling to share some of our experience some observations, and a couple of suggestions. Our family was extremely distressed to learn of the pending reclosure of our school, despite no reported cases in our school. Our kindergartner has had the best week he has had in eight months because he finally got to go to school and begin to make friends. Twice now, we've had to break into a five-year-old that he is not actually going to get to go to school. We are well past the summer months when plans were being made and there was less knowledge on transmission in schools. Schools have reopened across the country and across the state, and it is more clear by the day that in-school transmission is not common, particularly at the elementary school level, and even less so in environments that are well-prepared physically and procedurally, such as the ARPS facility. Do not put blinders onto the reality around us, which is increasingly clear that schools are not accelerators of this pandemic. No, it is not 100% safe, but nothing is. Families have skin in the game here. We want to put our children in the class environment. Kids are good at wearing masks in school, even preschoolers, probably better than adults. Another issue, private schools are open. They have been open for two months and without incident. So our district is showing that kids who by and large come from families with more money get to go to school in person. If you don't have the means to pay for private school or can't get in because they're quite full, then tough luck. Instead, your kid gets to sit in a Google Meet being shown sing-along videos and movies and being asked to mute. Is that in alignment with the district's mission? In-person school has become a privilege in this town rather than the fundamental right that all kids are entitled to. The agreement with the APEA with arbitrary metric levels triggering an automatic shutdown does a disservice to our community, our families, and especially our kids. It is long past time to stop putting the interest of children last. You have failed this community with this agreement, and our kids deserve better. So, our suggestions. First, it is time to get back to the table and negotiate a new deal and do so in open session. After the failures of this past several months, the town deserves better transparency. That means meeting every day, not twice a week. And when you do get to an agreement, don't set some distant date for reopening. Every single day these kids are not in school is a day they have been failed by this district. Please treat this crisis as the emergency that it is. Our second suggestion is that this is a lot of responsibility for the school committee and the superintendent. If you are not up to the challenge, then perhaps the district can defer to state guidance. An order from the governor shut the schools in the spring, and the district listened. That same governor is now urging schools to reopen using state guidance. The district should listen again. Thank you. Hello, this is Nancy Joe Haneke, the parent of a seventh grader at 
firms and a resident of Amherst. I'm speaking on my own behalf today and not in my role as a town councilor in Amherst. I urge the school committee and the superintendent to immediately revisit the metrics used to determine whether in-person learning can occur. The metrics that have been adopted are much too strict in terms of infection rates when looking at the experiences of other towns, counties, states, and countries, and much too broad in terms of geographic region. The metrics should more closely follow AAP and CDC guidelines. Further, they should more closely adhere to the towns that are in the district, not in the very large Pioneer Valley region. I also urge the school committee and the superintendent to immediately revisit the phasing schedule. There is no pedagogical reason for the district to have more than one phase. When students are able to return to in-person learning, all students should return, not just kindergartners and first graders. At a minimum, the return on November 9th should be for all Phase 1 and 2 students, and Phase 3 students should have their return rescheduled for November 16th, the original date, and not any later. Further, when the Phase 3 students return, it should be for a minimum of two days per week, not one. Again, there is no educational reason for continuing to insist that middle and high schoolers can't return to school at the same attendance levels as the youngest in the district. If first graders can handle all the requirements five days per week, like they showed they can this week, then seventh through twelfth graders can do the same two days per week on an immediate basis. They don't have to spend two to nine weeks of getting used to in-person learning once a week before moving to twice a week. New York City has returned to in-person education in other rural locations in New York and throughout the country have had students in school in person since early September without causing COVID-19 outbreaks. Amherst, Pelham, Shrewsbury, and Leverett aren't some weird outliers that have special circumstances. If New York City and thousands of other districts in this nation where the infection rates are higher than here can return safely, then so can we. The benefits to in-person learning outweigh the risks of infection related to return, given all of the precautions that have been implemented. Similarly, the harm caused to students and families by requiring all of them to learn remotely outweigh the small decrease in risk to those families by not operating in-person learning. This is just as true for 7th, 9th, and 12th graders as it is for kindergartners and first graders. At this time, the cost-benefit analysis clearly points to in-person education at the maximum level consistent with CDC safety guidelines. So I ask you to change the metrics and the phasing structure while simultaneously surveying all families for a return to in-person education so that all students who wish to can return to in-person Oops. I apologize for that. That's my fault. This is Lacey Reese. I live in Amherst, and my five- and nine-year-old children attend Crocker Farm. Since the APA seems keen on hearing the voices of people of color, I'll also state that I'm a black woman. There are so many things that I could say right now. The school committee voted to adopt the agreement just two weeks ago. Many parents stated over and over again that adhering to an arbitrary metric that is not based on the recommendation of any scientific body would lead to repeated closures. We foresaw this coming, and I cannot understand how the school committee and superintendent did not. If you believe in science and that we should adhere to evidence-based approaches, then the metrics we use for moving to remote learning must be based on the recommendations made by DEFI, CDC, Harvard Global Health, or some other credible body rather than the whims of non-experts. In Tuesday's meeting, Dr. Morris reported that 100 children have left the district, that many of them have gone to private schools, and that there will be financial repercussions. I want to respond directly to the statement that parents should know that their decisions affect the district. The school committee and APA, APEA need to know that their decisions impact district families and that they're putting us between a rock and a hard place. I would have removed my children from the district, but our local private schools are entirely full. Common School is already taking applications for next year, and I've heard the scene from high school parents who looked as far away as an hour. To get through the school year so far, my mother-in-law moved into our house for four weeks with my father-in-law traveling three and a half hours each way every weekend so he could see his wife. We then hired someone at the rate of $525 per week to bridge the last shutdown. Risk in our community has been and continues to be low. We believe in our public schools, but we believe that our five and nine-year-olds are better than what the district have offered. Families are being forced to pay for childcare anyway. Why would we not opt to pay a place that will go much farther in offering safe and consistent in-person learning than the district has so far? This is the moment for the school committee to get this right, and we should learn from and incorporate what we know about our community so far. 
First, we need a metric that is based on expert recommendations and moves with those recommendations if they change in the future. Second, consistent with CDC, Harvard, and other recommendations, the decision to move to remote should be based on multiple pieces of data that indicate whether there is increased risk specifically in our community, not in Springfield, not among college students, but in our school community and the individuals who are accessing our public schools. This means that our metrics should trigger consultation with public health professionals who have the education and expertise to make decisions about risk. One metric should not trigger an automatic shutdown. I want to support the district, but the district needs to adopt a route that shows it is supporting our children. I hope the school committee will do the right thing, reopen negotiations, and demand an evidence-based approach moving forward. The future of the district hinges Dear school committee, APEA, and administrators, my name is Renata Shepard, Amherst resident, and I am a parent of a second and tenth grader. It is very frustrating to hear that we have to start phasing in from zero when unreasonable metrics not even related to our schools trigger or remote learning. All around New England, schools are opening safely, taking care of business, and proving great schools are not a problem. I hope you are all aware that students whose families can afford it are leaving our district, which will lead to teacher and staff layoffs, more students per classroom, and less offerings for all our children. We love our teachers, but I believe the union is doing a disservice to them and to the community at large. We chose to pay higher taxes in exchange for better schools. Therefore, this agreement needs to be adjusted with parents and DSC taking part in the decision making since all families in this community are the ones paying to support the schools. Thank you. Hello, this is Jenny Hamilton of Amherst and parent of a Crocker Farm sixth grader. Um, first, let me say I really appreciate the efforts underway from all involved, the superintendent and central office staff, teachers and building staff, and you volunteer school committee members in particular. Like all of us, no one signed up for this. And I hope we all remember that everyone's doing the best we can with the best intentions for students, our beloved teachers, and our community safety. Regarding the metrics for remote versus in-person schooling, I do hope the district will reconsider the metrics currently being used. In this evolving crisis, we need some flexibility to assess actual threats based on infection rates, testing, and contact tracing beyond a set percentage. So since parents are all over the map in our opinions about remote versus in-person learning, I understand the same to be true for teachers. Addressing this very real public health concern and educational equity concerns through union negotiations seems misplaced. Given the unprecedented nature of this protracted public, public health crisis, I personally support the idea to have the town's health director decide whether and when students and teachers can be in the school building. Again, I thank you for your leadership and thank our teachers who are doing an amazing job. Hi, this is Anastasia Ordonez. I'm an Amherst resident and a mother of two Fort River Elementary School students. I understand that the school committee is working with our superintendent and district teachers to agree upon a metric for in-person learning that meets the health and education needs of our students, families, and district employees. Uh, I recognize that this is challenging to do in a normal year, but in the midst of a pandemic, when facts about the virus are changing rapidly, it's almost impossible. I also appreciate the concerns that are raised by some officials and parents about not overreacting to increasing virus infections in our county and revising the agreement on our metrics, metrics to ensure we return students to in-person learning as quickly as possible. However, I also strongly believe that our educators, many of whom are also our neighbors and fellow parents themselves, want what is best for our students too. And they are balancing their own health and mental well-being and that of their families in the midst of a pandemic that does not respect town or city boundaries. We've all read the news and we've watched as numbers have started to rise again in communities that everyone thought safe or recovered from the pandemic. And until we develop and distribute a vaccine, 
we should not take a position that the fears of essential workers, like our teachers, are unreasonable. I believe, and my husband believes, that we have a duty to educate our public school students and to protect our community's health at the same time. I hope that negotiations with the teachers' union over this agreement will be flexible enough to recognize our educators' concerns as legitimate and that we do not decry them. Thank you, as always, for all your hard work and your service to our community. We really appreciate it. Take care. My name is Isaac Larson. I am from Pelham, and I have two children enrolled in schools within the district. Both of my children are learning remotely, and they are receiving excellent online education from their teachers. My children are enrolled in online learning because we are in the midst of a global pandemic with cases rising locally, and online learning protects them and our community from the spread of COVID-19. It is not convenient in any sense, but it is the right thing to do. In fact, I view it as a civic responsibility. I am making a comment because I am disgusted with the school committee whose members have demonstrated that they are not leaders, but rather are merely politicians. And I mean that in the worst sense of the word. I'm disgusted because the school committee and their proxies, including the superintendent and other community members, have attempted to slander my children's teachers and are trying to force President Trump's school reopening agenda onto our community. Why does the school committee of Amherst, Massachusetts, of all places, have such regressive views regarding the health and safety of our community? No matter how much the school committee wishes COVID-19 does not exist, it is not going away anytime soon, and our schools must operate appropriately. Operating appropriately means closing when COVID-19 cases rise above the metrics that were negotiated, agreed upon, and signed by the school committee. I am thankful that the teachers in our district have the best interests of our community at heart and have decided that health and safety are important because clearly the school committee does not. Thank you. I'm now gonna present the uh, document. Um, and just as a reminder for folks that are watching at home, um, this document is posted on the agendas page of the Virginal School Committee um, webpage um, on arps.org. Are folks able to see that? Are you seeing my screen? Yeah, thanks. Um, just as a, uh, a, an alert, um, you'll see there's 47 pages here. So I'm going to scroll a little faster than my usual. Um, as I mentioned, um, it is available online so folks can um, come back and look at things that um, they may have missed as I scroll.
as a reminder, um, that document, that full document is available on um, the Regional School Committee agendas page um, and where you can access and read the full comments if I scroll too quickly. And I'm just pulling up the, the language for moving for our next agenda item. Um, so uh, I will uh, make a motion um, to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the APEA if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares, I declare, and with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Sorry, was that Ms. Spitzer? That was me, Ms. Spitzer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. Um, and we will now take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. McDonald, aye, and Sullivan, not present. And the motion passes unanimously eight to zero. We will now adjourn to executive session. <laughs>